So as I said, this is the last session of our Mars SHM seminar series, which uh, is, um, stands for Monitoring for Safe and Resilient Systems. This is a research collaboration between ETH Zurich and our group, the Chair of Structural Mechanics and Monitoring and ESPO in Ecuador, um, where we received the grant from the um, uh, Seed Money Grants Initiative of the Latin American House here in uh, Switzerland, which promotes uh, collaboration, or collaboration between Latin American universities and Swiss-based universities. And so our proposal uh, here was to establish a network uh, in the topic of structural health monitoring among different researchers from diverse departments working on uh, theories and concepts and uh, uh, new methods for SHM. And we tried to do this over a, a period of more uh, of about a year, actually, concluding today with this session of the, of the series, um, uh, which were largely built on this exchange that took place virtually, but uh, at least for us, it turned out to be a benefit. It brought us the opportunity to interact with others, possibly more remotely located. And now we have a page where you can, where, which we curate and where you can find the inputs and feedbacks and insights from all these different colleagues. So with this, uh, I don't want to say more, but I'll give the floor over to Christian, uh, the co-organizer, who will be introducing our two uh, speakers for today. And I think we start with the first one, but so Christian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eleni. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here today. We are going to uh, be listening to uh, Dr. Yang Wang's uh, presentation. Dr. Wang is a professor of civil and environmental engineering, but also a professor of uh, computer engineering, electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech in the United States. Uh, he's been a professor at Georgia Tech since uh, 2007. Uh, before that, he got uh, an undergrad and a master's degree uh, in civil engineering uh, in, in a, a university uh, in China, Tsinghua University in China. Uh, and after that, he went to, uh, uh, I believe it was uh, Stanford, and he got a, a master's degree in uh, uh, electrical engineering and a PhD in civil engineering. So he, his background is, you know, very multidisciplinary. He has uh, been awarded, he's been awarded with a lot of, with many awards, uh, including the uh, NSF Early Faculty Career Development and the Young Investigator, Investigator Award uh, from the Air Force. Office of Scientific Research. Uh, he's the author and co-author for of almost a hundred journal papers, and uh, he will be sharing with us uh, a talk uh, called "Finite Element Model Updating with Vibration Testing Data: A Non-Convex optimi Optimization Perspective." And please welcome, help me welcome, uh, Professor Wang. Welcome, and uh, the floor is yours, Professor. Thank you very much for the warm introduction, uh, uh, Dr. Silva. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, let me try to share my screen. Did it come through? Yes. All right. Well, hello again. Uh, uh, my name is Yang Wang. and. Uh, uh, I'm a professor in civil environmental engineering uh, at Georgia Tech, and uh, I hold a chocolate position in our electrical and uh, uh, computer engineering. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here uh, to uh, present our uh, research in the past, uh, about past decade, uh, focusing on uh, structural, um, a little part of structural health monitoring. And that's the model updating part. And we do some work uh, on wireless sensing development. So uh, there's some vibration test that um, uh, I uh, hope to report today. And also uh, after you get the uh, testing data, what do you do uh, with the data? Is that's the model updating part. And as we know, model updating is oftentimes formulated as a optimization problem. And we try to tackle the non-convex uh, uh, challenges in those optimization problems. So uh, I will start with a brief introduction, motivation, and uh, then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, first part of our my lecture is um, uh, how do we get more data for structural monitoring? So that's the water sensing part. 
The second part is after you get the data, what you do, what do you do with the data? And that's the model updating part. And like I said, we have a few different uh, uh, techniques, um, including the sum of squares, the Brownton bend, uh, Brownton bound, uh, and the, um, the structure model updating and open source Malib package software that I want to uh, introduce to everyone. Uh, hopefully, uh, you or your graduate students could find it uh, uh, useful uh, in your future work. So, uh, structural, mod uh, uh, structural modeling and simulation is uh, um, uh, a modern uh, technique that's not unique to uh, civil engineering. So, mechanical engineering, aerospace engineering, uh, they all deal with similar kind of uh, uh, mechanics and dynamics modeling. And uh, the quest to uh, make uh, our model more accurately reflect reality uh, is a dream shared by uh, all those nerds in different engineering disciplines. Um, you know, uh, when uh, with the computer uh, and computer science and the software engineering um, with such rapid development uh, in those domains in the past few decades, uh, our software really is getting more and more fancy, the graphics are getting more and more beautiful, but uh, whenever we uh, look at some fancy 3D animations, um, a fundamental question that we should all ask ourselves is uh, uh, how accurate is your model? Regardless of how fancy looking it is, how close is the model to reality? I think that's something that, you know, uh, that we, are, uh, um, we are all trying to uh, address in all those different uh, uh, engineering disciplines. And Coming down to a very, very simple example, that's a little footbridge uh, on uh, our campus uh, at Georgia Tech. Uh, the left column shows uh, the experimental frequencies and mode shapes, the first two uh, frequencies mode shapes and that we extracted from sensor data. Well, the right column shows uh, uh, the simulated uh, uh, behaviors uh, using nominal properties uh, of uh, the materials using structural drawings for dimensions, etc. cetera. Um, first, first of all, uh, we, as we often experience, and the uh, resonance, the natural frequencies between experiment and simulation are different. That's the first observation. You can compare those uh, uh, pairs of numbers. The second observation is that if you look at these uh, animations long enough, you can realize that um, in the experiment, uh, the first mode is sort of a lateral uh, vibration mode. Second mode is a vertical vibration mode. Uh, whereas in simulation, their sequence is also reversed. Okay. So, you know, this is a really naive, tiny footbridge. This is not a um, kilometer long uh, cable supported bridge, for example. It's, it's nothing like that and it's not a um, uh, high-rise uh, building either. It's a very simple structure, but even for a simple structure like this, as we uh, in uh, this business uh, are well, well aware that um, uh, our model um, oftentimes, um, most of the times uh, does not behave exactly the same way, in the same way as uh, reality. So uh, in order to, um, uh, make our model uh, closerly behave with uh, uh, a reality, uh, we often use experimental data to calibrate those models. So that is called uh, either called model calibration or model updating. And there's two aspects to this issue. The first is how do we get more data? And second is how do you get more data? What do you do with the data? So that basically is the uh, two parts of my presentation. Uh, in the first part, uh, in the, to address the first question, how do you get more data? Uh, uh, my research group uh, over the past uh, uh, couple of decades have worked on uh, uh, developing wireless sensing devices and that are convenient to install uh, on large scale uh, structures. So uh, the uh, device developed uh, uh, by Professor Karamijan's group uh, uh, in the 1990s at Stanford University, it was widely regarded as the uh, first uh, one uh, in the literature. And it's been 
uh, well more than two decades uh, from its uh, uh, you mentioned. And over the uh, uh, past uh, few decades, there have been uh, numerous industrial and uh, uh, academic devices that have appeared and people have uh, validated their performance. Uh, and I myself have started starting from my uh, PhD years with uh, uh, Professor Kincho Law at Stanford University of, and then working with Professor Jerome Lynch, uh, who is now, uh, who was then uh, at the uh, University of Michigan. We have worked on a few different uh, uh, wireless sensing devices. The three uh, red squares are the ones that we worked on. And uh, uh, in the recent years, we've mostly been using this so-called Martlet. Uh, a water sensing platform in a lot of our uh, field testing. Uh, the uh, Martlet water sensing uh, platform uh, has a, a 90 megahertz uh, uh, floating uh, CPU with a floating point unit. It's a dual core uh, uh, CPU and that allows uh, real time uh, two thread computation uh, going on in parallel. And it has a uh, 25 kbps. Uh, uh, radio that's uh, Zigbee compatible. Uh, we, we have designed the circuit, uh, the amplification so that uh, the uh, communication distance goes up to 800 meters uh, line of sight. So that's a good coverage for most bridges that we do uh, in the uh, instrumentations that we do in the field. So we try to implement very light radio frequency communication protocol, uh, guaranteeing real time response using, using state machine uh, implementation. Uh, the programming language is just common uh, C uh, language. So uh, it has a uh, debugging board that allows the, you to connect through this USB port with a PC so that you can have all this uh, graphical interface for debugging, for development, you just set breakpoint anywhere you like. And it's got uh, a uh, flexible modular uh, uh, layout. By modular, I mean uh, you depending on your application. So we've worked with uh, uh, Professor Lynch group at the University of Michigan back then and uh, Professor Andrew Swartz group at Michigan Tech and developed uh, tens of different uh, 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 daughter boards that we call those the wings of this uh, uh, Martlet uh, device. You can plug this onto the motherboard uh, in, to achieve different um, uh, uh, for different applications. And this is a um, uh, exploded view of uh, this is the motherboard uh, down here at the bottom. Uh, the dimension is about 2.5 inch multiplying 2.25 inch. That's the planar dimension similar to credit card size. And uh, <clears throat> above the motherboard, uh, there's this ultrasonic board. Uh, you can see these two golden connectors. We use this for uh, pitch cache, lamp wave uh, propagation for uh, capturing surface cracks. And this was a earlier version of the uh, circuit development. So we were able to generate uh, uh, up to 500 kilohertz uh, excitation launching lamp wave into uh, the uh, a metal surface. And then we could achieve a sampling rate up to three megahertz back then. And uh, uh, in our latest uh, development uh, for uh, ultrasonic thickness measurement, uh, we and develop a daughter board that is able to achieve up to uh, 80 uh, megahertz, and that's eight to zero. So for high accuracy uh, thickness measurement of uh, uh, metal plates. Above this uh, um, ultrasonic board is this string gauge board that we use often. If you have used string gauges, those green plugs look familiar to you, and that's for uh, us to connect that uh, the daughter board with uh, different uh, uh, string gauges. So we have uh, uh, signal conditioning circuits, uh, digi uh, digital potentiometers, allowing us to choose uh, between different uh, uh, measurement ranges and with fairly low noise floor and switching between different gauges, etc. cetera. And we also uh, have a general analog to digital conversion uh, board on top that allows you to connect the device with any sensor that uh, you want to use as long as the sensor has analog output signal. So it supports on-the-fly program booking and uh, cut of frequency, uh, allowing us to uh, best utilize the resolution uh, of the sensor device. There is also a, a digital to analog 
log control board. Uh, we in early days we use this one for real time feedback control applications for uh, for a few years. So that's the uh, modular layout uh, of the uh, of the sensor device and. Uh, I understand that uh, most of us are civil engineers, so that's about enough of the electronics I want to talk about before I bore everyone. Um, rather, I would focus this on a uh, uh, application. This is still a experimental structure, but uh, this is a uh, full scale uh, concrete frame. So you can see in this um, photo as if we have a two story building here, but these are actually uh, one, two, three, four separate uh, concrete frames used to be led by Professor DeRoche uh, at Georgia Tech with a NSF NIS uh, project. You can see the gap coming uh, through between the slabs. So uh, the slabs are separate and there are the sliders uh, between the slabs to make sure the one, two, three, four can uh, uh, move along the longitudinal direction uh, with uh, uh, with very little friction between them. So those are four separate and identical frames from construction for studying uh, seismic retrofits. And we leverage this, uh, this uh, uh, project to test our water sensing uh, uh, devices. So or, or also to get more uh, sensor data for structural uh, uh, model updating. And the left figure here shows the tens of uh, cable uh, acceleration channels. So the are uh, the kinematics epicenter uh, devices. If you are aware of them, those are not low cost uh, devices. They're fairly expensive instrumentation uh, in the left figure. So they all measure accelerations along those directions. Uh, right hand side, we had our low cost water sensing devices uh, interspersed between those blue nodes to add the nodal density uh, to uh, this uh, uh, instrumentation. So in total, uh, we had about uh, 60 cable uh, acceleration channels and the Indonesian had 66 uh, wireless uh, acceleration channels. So fairly dense uh, uh, instrumentation uh, on this uh, uh, frame. And we used the, uh, used to be NIS UCLA uh, linear shaker uh, mounted on the roof. So we don't have such a large shake table here at Georgia Tech. So this uh, roof mounting shaker was, uh, uh, was, was the best we could do to give the buildings um, a, a large shaking. And this uh, is from uh, a L central four inch scaled to four inch uh, vibration amplitude. You can see uh, the obvious movement of the frame one from this maybe more from the side view. And we perform the tens of tests for each frame until in the end, uh, significant damage was developed and we did not feel safe to continue the shaking anymore. So these uh, three rows shows three initial tests. In the first two tests, uh, we had L central one to two inch. So the cable of the system uh, and the shaker was ready ahead of schedule. So they started shaking without the wireless sensing device. And the four inch L central shaking was the one with, uh, you can see the uh, nodal densities, for example, on the column, this is much denser. Let me change the mouse to pointer so you can see it better much more dense uh, uh, instrumentation uh, than the previous two rows. You can also see on the edge of the slabs, uh, particularly on the third uh, mode, we could capture the uh, flapping motion uh, of the slab with, the, with, the, with wireless sensing devices. So three columns are the first mode, the second mode, and third mode. So those are all uh, frequencies and damping ratios. Uh, uh, and most ships uh, extracted uh, using uh, uh, the experimental data. So uh, with uh, low cost water sensing devices becoming more and more available and the performance improving or cost reducing, uh, we actually uh, are having uh, more and more data available. 
and not just uh, uh, water sensing devices. Uh, and there is also uh, interest. Um, uh, this is one of our earlier work. We actually have a, a more recent uh, robot pro prototype uh, ready to be deployed. So you have those water sensing uh, devices mounted on uh, those magnet wheeled robots that can uh, climb on this steel. Uh, that's actually the same uh, footbridge you saw earlier in my presentation. Um, so they can travel on this bridge and, uh, and they can stop at location. There's an accelerometer uh, on this flexible beam that can be squeezed pressed upon structural surface so that we can use a small number of uh, mobile nodes. We can get uh, uh, um, more uh, densely, uh, uh, more dense location uh, you, you measurements from more dense locations. So that's just the uh, uh, a small extension to the wireless sensor development we did. So the bottom line is that now we are actually having more and more data available. Um, that's a, a luxury we're enjoying, uh, which our uh, previous generation of engineers did not have. Uh, but actually that also uh, is raising a new question for us is, uh, what do we do with the data? So. Um, uh, many, many different um, uh, people studying uh, all this variety of algorithms for uh, structural damage detection, structural health monitoring. And our group has focused on uh, structural model updating, uh, which formulates uh, numerical optimization problems uh, to try to calibrate the model so that the model behaves better, uh, behaves more closely with uh, uh, field behavior. So that's my second part of the presentation. Well, Will, will be focused on is uh, this uh, uh, model updating side uh, of the game. And uh, as we mentioned, uh, we oftentimes formulate optimization problems. Actually, uh, sort of, a, you know, the, the philosophically, uh, our goal is to minimize the, the difference between theory and the reality. And that's why naturally how this becomes a optimization problem. And whenever we talk about optimization problems, um, complexity of the problem uh, is a, a very important property that makes uh, a, a huge difference in terms of how you solve the problem. Uh, so a complex optimization problem uh, uh, is roughly defined based on those two concepts. There's convex set and there's convex function. So convex optimization problem uh, in essence, is minimizing a convex function uh, over a convex uh, constraint set. So for a set to be convex, uh, this uh, very low dimensional illustration tells you that if you got two points in the set, you connect them with a line segment, then every point on this line segment still belongs to that set. So that's obviously, and this kinship gives you a convex uh, uh, set. And uh, this uh, uh, mathematical uh, uh, description to uh, what we can visualize in this low dimension uh, works, however, for arbitrarily high dimensional spaces. Your X and Y can be arbitrary n dimensional long vectors. So theta is a scalar, and this is a line segment between uh, those two. Uh, uh, points in uh, high dimensional spaces. So, uh, so this is saying that if uh, any point on this uh, hyperline segment uh, is still belonging to uh, this same set, then uh, this is a convex set. You pick any two points, then the line segment between them is in the set. So the mathematical definition applies to arbitrary high dimensional spaces. So likewise for a convex function, we could also only visualize very low dimensional spaces. This is when your input argument is only a scalar, that is when your input argument is a two by one vector. So that's about as much as you could visualize uh, um, so that human eyes, human eyes can see it. That means that this mathematical definition where uh, when you have this interpolation between those two points, you evaluate the function, that function value is always uh, smaller than or equal to uh, the uh, interpolation of those two functional values. 
So this mathematical definition uh, miraculously applies to arbitrarily high dimensional space. So that's a uh, quick definition of a convex function. And in essence, again, as I said, if we want to minimize uh, uh, a convex function, and if the constraint uh, are, uh, first of all, the inequality constraints uh, have uh, convex functions, f i of x are convex, okay? And then uh, your equality constraints must be affine constraints or linear constraints. If so, then you are guaranteed to have a convex constraint set. Your problem is uh, uh, a convex uh, optimization problem. So it was well known uh, decades ago that the great watershed in optimization is not between linearity and non-linearity, but rather it's been between convexity and non-convexity. If your problem is convex, then there are uh, off-the-shelf uh, uh, solvers that you can uh, rely upon that can efficiently solve fairly large problems. However, uh, if your problem is non-convex, uh, oftentimes, uh, if your problem is uh, non-convex uh, in high-dimensional space with unknown number of local minimum, then the problem becomes NP-hard. So again, you can only visualize very low dimension space. So when you try to find the optimal solution, if you try to uh, start your uh, gradient descent, for example, somewhere in this region, uh, you will likely end up at this local minimum. And uh, um, when you are talking about high dimensional space, there's no way to visualize the entire solution space. Uh, easily, you end up with a local minimum without any knowledge of where the global minimum is. So that's the challenge. Uh, with non-convex optimization. And unfortunately, uh, the kind of uh, pro meaningful problems that we deal with in mode updating oftentimes are uh, non-convex. Uh, so that uh, leaves us a lot of space uh, for, for research and for, for, solution, um, for solution hunting. So why are our problems non-convex? I hope uh, uh, these two slides are a little uh, equation heavy, but um, I hope it, uh, with this small example, uh, I can uh, help to convince that uh, indeed, even a very simple toy problem, um, updating of this simple toy problem give us a non-convex optimization problem and uh, uh, we need to be cautious uh, in uh, how to solve them. So my toy problem is a four, store, uh, four degree freedom uh, structure with uh, known masses and uh, assuming that um, all the initial interest rate stiffness uh, are 10 uh, pounds per inch. And we assume that uh, there may have been some property change uh, in the top uh, story and the actual us built uh, is uh, nine pounds per inch instead. And we assume that the, the change location is known. That means this is the only stiffness unknown. We know it's here, but we pretend that we don't know how much it is. We want our uh, model updating algorithm to uh, find how much uh, that stiffness actually is. So we also assume that um, uh, we instrument not all of the degrees freedom. So that's what happens in practice. You can only instrument a very small portion oftentimes in practice of your all degrees freedom. So you assume that we instrument the first three degrees freedom, uh, leaving uh, the top uh, floor uninstrumented. So there is one unknown that's the stiffness here. So we assume we know that there's no stiffness change at other places. And there's one unknown with this psi four. So uh, perhaps this helps to visualize. So assume that our experimentally, we can extract the first uh, natural frequency from this wireless sensor at this amount. And we have those three, uh, first three uh, floors instrumented. We know we normalize them by the largest uh, uh, most of entry. And so we have those three values uh, already known. But because we did not instrument the top floor, so our psi four is unknown in that uh, most of vector. So we have two unknowns in this problem. Uh, there is this. Uh, 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 psi four, that's this unmeasured uh, um, most of entry and alpha represents the relative change, relative change of K4 from the nominal value. 
course, we have this toy simulation problem. We know the ideal solution. So alpha should be negative 0 0.1, that's a 10% reduction. And so far it should be this amount because we, again, we do simulation, we know the uh, perfect answer. So with this toy problem, we formulate this uh, model updating uh, uh, formulation uh, in, in optimization, in terms of optimization. So we minimize this so-called model dynamic residual. So K minus uh, natural frequency square multiplied mass, multiplied mode shape vector from structural dynamics. Ideally, that should be uh, zero from structural dynamics. Uh, so we try to minimize that two norm to the power of two, okay? And that's the objective function. So we assume mass is known. We assume we know the stiffness at, at other locations uh, uh, has zero change. So um, this K naught is the uh, nominal stiffness. K4 is the influence uh, for this uh, uh, fourth story, interstory stiffness. So it's multiplied by this alpha uh, unknown. And this multiplying, so the psi m is the measured part uh, of this uh, uh, optimization uh, of this uh, motion vector. So uh, bottom uh, psi 4 is the unknown. So you got two unknowns, alpha and psi four. Those are the two unknowns. We want to find their optimal value so that we could uh, minimize uh, uh, this objective function. And the, the constraints are simple, a box constraints. The constraint is definitely convex constraint. It's a box constraint. So assume alpha uh, can't be too small. So you can't have too much of a stiffness reduction uh, as to become a negative stiffness and can't have too, uh, too much increase in that from the nominal stiffness either. So alpha is the relative change, percentage change. So therefore, we also assume since we have normalized uh, the uh, mode shape entries from the first three stories, so to be maximum to be one, so we assume that's a reasonable range for, for Psi4 to, uh, to start with. So that's the simple problem. And because the problem is so small, because we know all those blue uh, so I try to uh, have the red font represent unknowns. All the blue numbers are known. So we could actually plug in all those blue numbers, uh, entries for those um, blue numbers to get to expand this polynomial function. But for that, I want to point out before, because of this multiplication inside the norm, there's alpha multiplying psi four inside this norm. This is a non-convex uh, objective function. <coughs> so we actually could expand that function because we know all the numbers. Uh, you can see this comes out as a polynomial function. There's a linear term, uh, a quadratic term, and the fourth order is the highest order that we have. And the left, the figure down here is a control plot of this objective function over those two variables. So that's alpha between negative one and one, psi four between negative two and positive two. Uh, the contour line uh, uh, show the, the values on the contour line shows the values of this objective function. The star is where that global minimum is. That's where the ideal solution is. Um, so that is uh, alpha is 10% uh, reduction and that's the psi four value. However, and there is even for a toy problem like this, there is a saddle point that we observed uh, right here for this alpha and psi 4 value. And that's a zoom in to this saddle point region. Uh, you can see uh, uh, indeed this uh, a function, uh, objective function is not a convex function even for a simple toy problem like this. So depending on where you start your gradient search, you could end up uh, uh, at the position and that's not your global uh, minimum. So that's the bottom line. If you're bored with the equation, that's the message that I want to can make it through. So now that we know the optimization problem is non convex, uh, what do we do? So the first uh, approach uh, is the so called sum of squares method we uh, explored. In order to use the sum of squares method, we first uh, rewrite these two constraints into polynomial functions uh, like this. Okay, there's a reason for that. So this SOS method uh, works for non convex problems. <laughs> but problems must have polynomial objective and the constraint functions. 
So uh, objective function is polynomial. This constraint function, both of them are also polynomial. And constraint functions must have non-negative inequality constraints. So this is a non-negative inequality constraints. That's also a non-negative inequality constraints. So that's the reason we had to do that little rewriting. And without getting into the weeds of all these mathematical details, uh, uh, what the big idea is that the SOS method can convert your original uh, non-convex optimization problem into a semi-definite uh, program, programming problem. So semi-definite program problem is known to be convex. So uh, um, not without getting into uh, the ways of these uh, mathematical details. Uh, that's, that's, the, uh, that's what this SOS method does. You see this curly greater than equal to that represents this Q matrix uh, is a symmetric positive semi-definite matrix. So that's, that's one of the uh, QI is uh, unknown. So that's why this is called the semi-definite programming uh, problem. And my former PhD student, Dan Li, who is now a professor at the uh, Southeast University in China, uh, was the uh, student that uh, uh, delved into all these details. And we had a, a number of publications that came out from this, uh, from this work. So the long story short, the converted SDP problems convex. Uh, you can use off-the-shelf optimization solvers to solve them with uh, tens of thousands of variables. So that's good news. We can cast that into combat. However, because the size of the commercial problem increases exponentially with the dimension of the optimization variables, uh, so far only relatively small examples uh, can be uh, practically, pra practically solved. So this is one of the larger examples if we were able to solve uh, where uh, key one, the three spring stiffness and Young's modulus for the top bars, uh, the middle bars and bottom bars, those are the six uh, uh, update, uh, students updating variables. And we assume we measured a, about half of those degrees of freedom. But this little 2D trust, it's a toy problem, is um, about the largest size that we're able to solve with SOS. So definitely a lot more. Uh, research to do in the future to, to make it uh, work for larger problems. And second method we tackled on is this called branch and bound method. So a branch and bound uh, is like a global optimization algorithm used in uh, other engineering fields as well. So to quickly go through the idea, uh, when you have a original non-convex optimization problem, um, you start by uh, finding a uh, this is called a convex relaxation. You can also call this a convex bond. And of course, you want this bond to be convex, but also as tight as possible. Tight means it envelopes your original function as closely uh, as possible. So you solve this convex uh, optimization problem, then uh, the value right here would be guaranteed to be a lower bound so, because that's in this illustration is your original uh, uh, global minimum, it's a lower bound. And then uh, you do a, a gradient search from any point to solve your original problem. You could end up with a local minimum. Now local minimum is guaranteed to be upper bound of your original global optimum. Because again, here is your global optimum. So now it's guaranteed to be upper bound. So after this, or oh, if the difference between those two are small enough, that means you are close to your uh, uh, global optimum, you can stop. However, uh, if not, you do a branching. So you branch this uh, into two regions, uh, and then you do a convex uh, bounding for both regions. You find the lower bound of each region, and then uh, you keep doing this kind of uh, uh, iteration, uh, go back to step one, all the way through. So it's sort of a brutal force method. Keep subdividing the region, keep doing bounding until uh, in the end, you, uh, you, you are close to the global optimum. So it's not guaranteed to always find the global minimum, but it's guaranteed to give you a, a certificate. So what is called a certificate, that's the difference between this upper bound and this lower bound. So we know from the global minimum, we're not more than optimal away from that. So if you are interested in any of those details, again, we have a pub recent, very recent publication out here that you can read through. And that's my graduate student, Yu Osuke, who has focused on this. Uh, uh, exa uh, this uh, work, and we apply this on a, a Japanese uh, uh, e-defense uh, 
19, uh, 18 story uh, test structure. And we got some fairly good results. That's before uh, model updating between initial and experiment. You can see a big difference. This is using the branching bound uh, after updating. We got uh, a much uh, closer match. So the last part of my uh, uh, presentation is this SMU package. So although we have those two SOS and the BNB uh, stop being under study, we realized that, that uh, it is indeed challenging to make them work for a large, for practical problems. So in practice, what do we do? What can we do when you do have a model of thousand degrees freedom you want to update? The best you can do is do a random search. You start from uh, as many uh, randomized initial points as possible. You go down the gradient. You find the smallest you can achieve in the end. So to this end, we have a software package shared on my website. You can see new web address here. Uh, it's open source, shared on GitHub. Uh, in case you want to do any improvement, feel free to do so on our existing software. Uh, we support multiple model updating formulations and code support search for many random uh, feasible starting points and allows flexibility using various uh, model optimization toolboxes as well. And we uh, perform efficient gradient search using analytically derived Jacobian for all those different formulations. Uh, we have examples uh, down to four degrees freedom up to thousand degrees freedom. Uh, also with all the source code available for you to, for you to play with. So it's shared on GitHub. Uh, if you click on the GitHub link, that's the GitHub page that uh, I will take you to. We have uh, fairly detailed commenting for those key uh, functions, explaining how you should set up any of these variables if you were to uh, use this uh, package. And this companion paper nice, was just published this year uh, has uh, an example and also some example code for you to uh, get started in case uh, uh, you're interested in uh, giving this a try. So uh, in the interest of time, uh, I think I'm gonna skip a few slides on the detailed formulation. There's this Mac value formulation. Uh, there is this uh, eigenvector difference formulation. That's model dynamic residual formulation. Those are different formulations available in the current uh, version of the package. And where once in a while we do some improvement, we uh, we try to release a, uh, a new version of the package. So just long, remind everyone again, uh, uh, when your problem is non convex, uh, uh, depending on different starting points, your gradient search can end up at different local minima. So the best you can do is to randomize your initial feasible point and do uh, the search um, from as many uh, initial starting points uh, as possible. So. Uh, uh, and in, oftentimes in practice, your uh, bar, uh, optimization model is in high dimensional space. You can't visualize it like this. My lab optimization toolbox cannot guarantee global optimality. It's kind of confusing that there is a global optimization toolbox, but you also realize that uh, not so called global optimization toolbox is a misnomer. It's trying to make some better efforts, but does not guarantee any. A global humanity does not give you any certificate either, like branching bound gives you. So our SMU package helps to improve the chance of finding a, a better uh, local minimum or finding the global minimum by supporting search from randomized starting points. So a quick summary, uh, we have one more wireless sensing devices making data available and uh, uh, optimization problems mode updating generally are, are non-convex and uh, off-the-shelf algorithms cannot guarantee global optimality. Uh, despite, so I would call this SOS and BNB, those are truly global algorithms. Uh, despite those algorithms, practical optimization of large-scale problems still uh, is still going through this randomized gradient search because SOS and BNB cannot solve large-scale problems. Uh, so finally, you are welcome to uh, download our open source uh, package on GitHub. Uh, with the appreciate support from National Science Foundation. Thank you everyone for your time and attention. Thank you very much Jan, for this uh, presentation, uh, which was also, you know, went quite in detail in the formal aspect of, uh, of updating, uh, which is maybe a bit different to what one usually sees in the Bayesian framework and so forth. 
So let's open the floor for questions since um, we have a bit of time for that and I don't want to take away from the audience since we don't we have two speakers today so we don't want to uh, take too much time. Yeah, I'll try to be, be brief as yeah. well in answering. So any questions for Jan? Maybe a first question for me, which relates on what I, on the intro I basically did. Uh, so this optimization, this model updating that you suggest relies on what we would call deterministic optimization, I guess. Uh, what, are, what is the room for uncertainties in, in this kind of a framework? So the, what I presented today does not uh, uh, include uh, uh, any uh, uncertainty or stochastic uh, mm -hmm. uh, behavior of the, uh, of the problem. Um, so the hope is uh, with a, a non-convex uh, optimization algorithm uh, studied or being developed, um, uh, that could also be used for uh, model updating with certainty because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, uh, those problems with uncertainty uh, uh, are often formulated as optimization uh, problem as well. So that's, uh, we hope, our contribution uh, toward that end. Uh, if the problem uh, was uh, were formulated as optimization problems, then uh, those non-convex uh, optimization algorithms could potentially help to find a better solution mm -hmm. in that regard. But you're right, this uh, uh, formulation stays safely in the deterministic domain, mm -hmm. but also, you know, we, I think we should make it clear to people that even in this uh, deterministic domain, uh, the problem is not as simple as we thought. It's not as simple as you just shove it into a multiple optimization toolbox, you're guaranteed to have the uh, ideal solution available. It's actually more than that. We are actually not solving uh, this simple deterministic uh, linear problem uh, uh, well yet. Yeah. I see Fernando unmuted himself. So this is one of our speak previous speakers whom you also know. I don't know if there is a question, Fernando. Ah, uh, no, maybe it's a, a mistake. So let me uh, give the floor over to uh, Christian. Thank you Thank very you, much. Thank you, everyone. Feel free to email me if you have any other questions later. Thank you, Yang. So if you guys have any questions or uh, you know, further comments, you can always uh, write Professor Wang directly to his email. His contact information should be in, uh, you know, you, you can Google Scholar him directly. And I'm sure you'll find his contact information. Uh, so our next speaker today is gonna be uh, Nikos Dervilis, uh, Professor Nikolaos Dervilis, who um, is going to be uh, sharing the second talk of today. Um, Professor Dervilis is a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Sheffield in the UK. And uh, he's also a member of the Dynamics Research Group. Um, he does research primarily in offshore wind farms, structural health monitoring, pattern recognition, and machine learning data analysis and information. Uh, he studied physics in the National and Capodistrian University of Athens. And he got his master in sustainable and renewable energy uh, from the University of Edinburgh. Um, he also obtained his PhD from the University of Sheffield. So he's uh, an in-house person in the University of Sheffield, mechanical engineering department. So uh, his talk today is going to uh, focus in uh, uh, supervised learning. So the name of his talk is Active and Partially Supervised Learning with Engineering Data. Welcome, Professor Lerilis, and the floor is yours. Hello, all. Thanks a lot, Christian, and thanks a lot, um, Ellen, as well, for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, and thanks for reminding me that I'm getting older. Um, so let me share my screen. So, can you see my screen? Great. Now, I think it's a uh, full mode um, now. So again, um, thanks a lot again for inviting me and thanks everyone um, being around uh, today. So I'm Nikos. Um, 
uh, from uh, University of Sheffield and the Dynamics Research Group. Um, as you can see, I have a very fluent uh, Greek accent. Um, and uh, despite being here 13 years now, and uh, I'm gonna talk today, I was thinking what I would like uh, to give a short talk today. And I think I'll, uh, I'll talk about one of my big guilty pleasures, which is um, uh, partially, uh, partially supervised uh, learning. Now, it will be mainly SHM uh, examples, but um, nothing stops uh, for this to be used in, uh, in any other uh, context. Um, obviously, um, a lot of this work, um, I would say the majority of this work comes from uh, uh, Lawrence, Lawrence Bull. Um, Lawrence uh, was my first PhD student, and then he did his postdoc in uh, Sheffield. And then he betrayed me and stabbed me in the heart. And he went uh, to Alan Turing Institute, uh, where he's based now. Uh, but um, we still have common PhD students with Lawrence, and we work a lot uh, together. And the rest of the authors is uh, Professor Cross from the University of Sheffield, Tim Rogers from the University of Sheffield, Keith, probably you all know Keith, uh, Keith Worden and oh, Paul Gardner as well here in the University of uh, Sheffield and last uh, myself. So my contribution is bananas essentially because a lot of this work comes from, uh, from Lawrence and Lawrence is brilliant. Um, now, everything that I'm gonna talk today, but with tons of other stuff that I can mention at the end, you can all go and find all the algorithms um, both in Python and uh, MATLAB in GitHub. They have uh, full tutorials, all the associated papers. They have a lot of toy data examples so you can uh, play around. Uh, you can add comments. Uh, you can feel free to drop us out to myself and Lawrence uh, if you have any issues, but all, all the algorithms uh, are all there and uh, free open access uh, to, to use all of them. Uh, so, um, great. Now, I suspect, um, now, uh, Christian, Eleni, uh, I can't see the time, so um, whenever you yeah, want. Yeah, I might give you a heads up at about 20 yes. past, so we are great. not very great. much here. Yep, 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 thanks. Now, uh, SHM, Structural Health Monitoring, I suspect most of you are aware of it, uh, essentially is um, a technology that uh, we use for years now in order to assess the health of a structure. And uh, obviously we capture some data. We saw a lovely talk uh, before me on um, model data, vibration data. And obviously, uh, we take this data, we extract the most useful features, and we use these features as an input uh, to assess and uh, the, the health of the structures and do some diagnostics. And obviously, we have database SHM, we can have physics based SHM, or we can have a hybrid of the two now with gray box models. I'll talk more about data uh, though uh, today. And um, Usually in SHM, obviously we have a detection, classification, uh, assessment, and life cycle assessment of the structure. And SHM, by definition, uh, from Chuck and Keith, um, from the Bible, um, should be online and continuous. Um, although uh, we can do things offline uh, as well. Now, I don't want to stay a lot about SHM, but why I'm going to uh, talk today about the active and semi-supervised learning and how we query data is more one of the big challenges we have, not just on SHM, to be honest. You can forget the name SHM. It's generally on engineering data. I think we know that um, labeled data from engineering structures is quite sparse. And... Um, a lot, a lot expensive, very expensive, a lot of times in order to be able uh, to capture different forms of labels, different stages of labels. And um, 
one of the things we can start looking is how we can infer information from limited labels, how we can um, extend our understanding when we want to use labeled data. And obviously we need labeled data in, in health monitoring and engineering uh, generally, because we can uh, progress uh, in the hierarchy of uh, localization, classification, in life cycle assessment. We can do a novelty detection and we can do damage detection just on supervised learning. But if we want to assess and go further, uh, we need some forms of, uh, of labels. So what I'm gonna talk today, I'll not cover all the slides. Uh, I'll just give the breath of a couple of things um, and uh, feel free um, to get the references or go to the GitHub page and check all, all the rest uh, if, if, you, if you want to and interested. Uh, so uh, usually what we have to, as an introduction in SHM is uh, we provide some uh, labels sometimes on a, li on a limited uh, label data and then we're trying uh, to make an inference, an inference along uh, the labeled uh, data set. So let me uh, skip here and go directly to an example. Now, this is an example uh, I always steal uh, as the example from uh, Rhys, Rhys Pulim in Cardiff, who is a really, really good friend and they're experts in acoustic emissions. So I'll give you an example now of um, clusters as they evolve in an SHM uh, perspective. So this is here, you can see some acoustic emission uh, campaign they were doing in Cardiff uh, on, um, on this bridge-like structure, and they were getting out uh, the bursts of the acoustic emissions. Acoustic emissions, for those who don't know what they are, is just a passive wave. So every time you have a heat or you have a source, there's um, an elastic wave that uh, propagates uh, and uh, you get the burst uh, of the pink. Uh, so, um, as we said, we captured the data and then we need uh, some features out of this, uh, of this data. So uh, some typical features we can get from acoustic emissions is duration, is uh, the rise time, ring town um, uh, count, or we can check uh, the pink amplitude. So you can have this four dimensional feature and we can use this, this four dimensional feature uh, as our uh, input uh, to an SHM uh, perspective. Now, if we plot uh, these four features uh, in a two-dimensional uh, space, so uh, we can use principal components, so we can see how these four features span into a two-dimensional space, you can start looking that there are some uh, patterns that they start uh, to form. And these patterns, you can see on the left side that they start uh, to form, uh, there are three different uh, labels of three different situations that they're happening in this bridge uh, 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 and structure, bridge-like structure. So uh, the red one is the crack extension. Uh, the blue color is the frictional processes that they're happening away, away of the crack. And you can see the green, which are events, crack-related events at the quite uh, distance, uh, on a distance from, uh, from the sensors. So you can see here with our engineering data, we have three distinct situations that are happening. And obviously if we know exactly uh, these labels, we can do supervised learning. We can associate all these data points with a specific label. I think one of the issues uh, that we'll start looking here is what happens if we don't have all these labels, if we don't have all this engineering knowledge, how we know how many uh, clusters they start to be forming. Now you can do is, as we said, supervised way. So we associate a data point directly uh, with a label. Uh, and then we can start making obviously uh, predictions. Uh, and then we can form boundaries across these uh, clusters. And uh, whatever, whenever we have a new test point based on the supervised uh, procedure we did, so each point associated with a label, every time a new data point comes, we see if it falls in any of the margins that we created with the supervised uh, classification. If it falls into the blue, the green, or, or, or the red. Now, 
One, obviously, uh, can do that in an unsupervised uh, way. So can use an unsupervised clustering uh, technique to form uh, clusters. But then you can see, although we know from our engineering knowledge that there are three clusters, essentially, in an unsupervised way, you can start having four clusters or five clusters, depending on of your hyperparameters, depending of how many uh, centers you want on your supervised learner. And there things start to become a little more uh, complicated because you can start having um, false uh, clustering uh, procedures. So, uh, as I said, how many clusters to define and how to label these, these clusters. So an alternative on that, if we don't have all the engineering labels, is uh, how we can use uh, partially supervised uh, learning. And we have active learning, we have semi-supervised learning, uh, and active learning is mainly query learning. So we query the data points as they come along. Semi-supervised learning is a, a part of the active learning, and they're both they're part of a bigger family of transfer learning. But semi-supervised learning essentially is that we have some few uh, data points uh, with labels, and then we propagate this information across uh, our, our data. So active learning, uh, you can see here again, the three clusters of the acoustic emission uh, data set. And one of the things you can see in the active learning is a cluster-based active learning and classifier-based active learning. So in the cluster-based active learning, what we want, we want to compare points with some metric and start forming clusters. And as we form clusters, we compare the clusters with each other, and then we see if they can come close or if they're not close together. And that's why you create a dendrogram which you prune. And essentially, this is what I'll show you. And this is mainly offline a procedure. So we, we can take a random sample of the measured data, and uh, we can start investigating some points of this measured uh, data. And this is what I said. We start with a large pool of unlabeled data. We can create a grid and we use any clustering procedure you want, any metric you want, even Euclidean distance uh, you can use between uh, the data points. And after we partition uh, our space, uh, we start uh, to, to, to sample through this uh, grid and we start querying points. And then we start uh, comparing the points with each other with based on a metric and a threshold. And then we start creating a dendrogram where we split the, the clusters. And then we compare the clusters with each other in, in a loop. So we start creating a more robust way of, uh, of looking into uh, this, uh, these clusters. And obviously you can have uncertain portions as you can see here, or you can have more certain portions uh, you can see here. Uh, and mainly the uncertain portions is where uh, the clusters are, are obviously uh, different. You will see in a bit how we can do that uh, better with active learning and uh, bring what we all love, Bayesian and Bayesian framework uh, inside. I can't escape from that from the group, uh, whatever I do, even if I say neural network and I say to use a neural network, the next day someone will do Gaussian processes. So I think I'll forget how neural networks work at the end. But you can see uh, a Bayesian uh, perspective later. So um, this way, with this clustering procedure, you can start creating the exact same thing we saw with the supervised learning. But this time, you can start creating that with this hierarchical uh, clustering procedure. This is quite expensive to do uh, online. And uh, that was one of the first things we started looking in this hierarchical agglomerative uh, clustering uh, procedure. Um, obviously, you can uh, recreate these margins um, with whatever algorithm classifier you want. This is a linear uh, margin, but you can use whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Now, here is an example. These are two uh, aircraft wings. And these aircraft wings, I'll not go into details. We didn't want to damage them. So we've put panels on these aircraft wings. wings. Each panel had a different size. And by removing uh, the panels, we started to recreate it, recreating some labels of um, 
damage uh, uh, of a damage perspective. Very small uh, panels, bigger panels, and all these, we had sensors, excitation points and sensors across them, as you can see in the picture of the ride, and we were collecting the transmissibilities and the FRFs of these of this, uh, wings. So what we wanted to do, we wanted uh, to label and cluster uh, all these uh, clusters that we're creating of these dim, different damage proxies of removing the panels. So you have nine panels here, so you would expect to have nine clusters to start forming. As you can see, SHM is not, is not uh, easy. You can see how uh, mental are these nine different clusters. So you can see a lot of classes are coming together. Obviously that, even with supervised learning, is quite difficult a lot of times. Uh, so we start. We wanted to see comparing how we had uh, the prediction with uh, supervised learning and how we could do with this agglomerative uh, clustering procedure. How how close we could come to a fully supervised learning to compare this uh, and label predict these uh, classes. So uh, you can see here the supervised learning. We have very good prediction because we know the labels is a red line. And we wanted to see how well we convert as we go along uh, by querying uh, points. And one of the things all the machine learning uh, geeky community does when uh, using this active semi-supervised learning thing is random sampling. So they random sample numbers and they see also with random sampling how well uh, you can label the data points. And um, it was lovely. Uh, we could see that uh, after a number of query points, we can go very close with the active learning, the, 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 the clustering dendrogram active learning procedure very close to the supervised learning after almost uh, 80, eight, just 80 points. Uh, so with, with a small number of, uh, of query points. And that was really, really nice. And we could get uh, a 95.5% uh, of the accuracy of the supervised learning performance using only 3% of the labels of the data points. And I think that that was a really, really uh, nice result because it shows that even with few points by having the right querying mechanisms, you can start having a very good uh, prediction. Now, one of the things that Lawrence puts always as a limitation, this is not probabilistic. So we're doing something wrong. So we had to invent a probabilistic way of doing that uh, as well. So what I'll show you now is how we can use uh, Gaussian mixture models and some lovely uh, query metrics to do it online and do it uh, uh, actively. So here I come to the classifier-based uh, active learning. That's the exact same example. We love this toy example because of the clusters. And we'll start doing the exact same procedure. But here we have a different way of dealing with the, the classifier based active learning. We start with a very small random sample of the of, uh, of label data and we build a classifier. So this is a Gaussian mixture model a classifier. And uh, as we start building our GMM around uh, limited uh, data points, we use metrics. And the metrics we used here is uh, entropy and low likelihood. And you can see here, entropy measures how um, informative are the data points across uh, the borders and says, look, based on my entropy measure in this Make sure models that your borders cross, you need to go and look and query the data. You need to investigate more. And it can take the low likelihood data points, so can see the points that they're far from our main uh, clusters. And it says the same. Look, these points are quite away. So check this as well in terms of, of the algorithm. So it does a double job. It takes checks the information me metric, and it checks the low likelihood metric. Now, Aidan, uh, he did a lovely work recently where we changed the metrics and we added a risk-based metric as well. So you can use active learning to risk-based uh, analysis uh, as well. 
you can change the metrics as quickly. Actually, you can go to the GitHub, download the code. It's fully there with all the all this uh, toy data, and you can change whatever you want in terms of metrics. And um, here is the a lovely uh, flow chart, but I'll not go into that. I'll give you an example. And here is uh, the very rare uh, Z24 bridge that probably none of you has ever used. So the Z24 bridge uh, was a bridge in uh, Switzerland, and this bridge had uh, gone through a big uh, campaign uh, of uh, monitoring uh, of monitoring uh, the bridge. Uh, and uh, they collected the, uh, they did a model analysis, operational model analysis using stochastic subspace identification. And here, what you can see out of that is the four natural frequencies are, as we track them, as we track them down. The nice thing about the Z24 bridge is except the damage uh, that was introduced into the peers of the bridge that starts after uh, point, uh, 3,500, you can see some peaks, some peaks before that, and you can see down the temperature. So when we had freezing uh, temperatures, uh, the uh, uh, frequencies were shifting. And especially the second natural frequency had the real um, nonlinear uh, effect. So as you can see, uh, between points 1,200 to 1,500, there are some shift on the on the frequencies due to freezing temperatures of the asphalt, uh, but also you can see freezing temperatures popping up before, before that uh, as well with some uh, uh, peaks. Uh, so one of the things we wanted to see is if we can start clustering uh, correctly in an online manner as, as we query data with the two metrics of the entropy and the likelihood based on the uh, Gaussian mixture models. Uh, the, the 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 data points so remember we query the data points only based on two metrics as they come along and i think if i can play that so you can see here we query the red only very few points we don't query all the points and we start building uh, the classifier so you can see as we query the points down you can see how it starts building the different clusters uh, of uh, the Z24 bridge. And all this can happen online with batches, with streams of data uh, coming through. So what you can see here, you can see it detects as it should detect based on very few data points. Um, uh, the blue is the normal uh, frequencies, uh, normal without any shifting of the frequencies. And you can see the cold temperatures, which is the orange uh, color. And you can see how it can track down then uh, the damage, which is uh, uh, the yellow color uh, as, as, uh, as it comes along. So uh, to give you a perspective, so with 4.2% of uh, the data, uh, the, the, the active learner was able to, to give a really, really good um, uh, um, a score, F1 score, a very good uh, prediction score. And you can see it over, it did even be much, much better than the random uh, sampler uh, as well. So it goes up to 98, 99%, just with 4% of the, of the data. And obviously, it can start getting better and better if you allow it uh, and so uh, batches more of more uh, data as you go along. And as you increase that, obviously, uh, the, the classification increases and increases. Power on. Um, Power on. That was my speaker. Uh, so um, I'll give you another example uh, um, as well. Um, Elaine, I don't know how much time I have. Uh, Ten but, minutes, uh, you could take. Okay, great. So um, this is another example. This is uh, an example that came through uh, a company uh, that um, Chandi uh, was working. Uh, Chandi is now a postdoc in our group. Uh, she was our PhD student as well, and uh, Chandi was working on machining data. 
and acoustic emission data, machining data. So I show you some features before on the Z24 coming from vibration-based uh, data. And that was uh, something that the company that Chandi was working uh, and she was directly funded by this company was about uh, drilling procedures and tool, uh, tool wearing, which is very, very critical for um, aerospace industry. Um, so what they wanted to do is by remote acoustic emission sensors, they wanted to see the tool wear uh, from measured data uh, and keep the inspections of the tool as minimum as possible. Um, and here uh, you can see at the left and the right uh, hand side of the pictures, how uh, the tool wears as it operates on uh, an aerospace um, uh, perspective. So that was drilling uh, part of an aerospace structure. Now, why this this is important? Because you know, in aerospace industry, uh, they cut chunks at once. They don't glue things. So you don't want to stop easily the procedure, and you don't want to change the tool uh, all the time. On the other hand, you don't want a faulty tool because that can cause underperformance on the solid chunk of, uh, of um, metal uh, they're cutting through. Now, by getting the acoustic emissions and by using uh, microscopic analysis, what we want is if we want it, we want it to uh, first label with our engineering knowledge as good as possible in a supervised way, uh, what we are looking into this uh, tool wares. So we identify nine uh, classes of uh, tool wear and uh, you can see that um, uh, class 10, which is the far red one, at the right hand side is when the tool went uh, bonkers. So it, uh, it broke. So you can see here that we start looking into uh, nine different classes of different tool wear uh, severity. And also we have a very distinct class that the tool obviously, obviously failed. Uh, and obviously we project this, this classes in three dimensions using principal component, but what it was acoustic emission data. So imagine that we were taking uh, several features out of the acoustic emission uh, signal to construct the dimensional space. Uh, now, all the measured data was coming in streams through online through the acquisition system and the, and the metric system the company has. And what we wanted, we wanted to put inside the loop, uh, the active learning uh, with very limited number of uh, label queries and see if we can online uh, identify uh, the different clusters as they're starting uh, to form. Uh, so um, you can see here uh, directly on the results that um, uh, the active learner with 8%, 8.3, 3% to be exact, uh, of uh, the data, uh, it could start giving some really good um, uh, F1 score. So it started giving a really, really good uh, classification. And you can see it has some bumps, obviously, as it as the batch number of data comes through. But bear, bear in mind that this is only 8% of the data. So you can see after the point uh, uh, 28, 30, um, batch number, sorry, 28, 30, it starts to stabilize and it goes to a really, really high uh, uh, accuracy. And comparing as well with, uh, with random data, uh, you can see that um, it, it does really, really well and it is guided by the metrics that we discussed before. Uh, and obviously, again, if you do the same experiment, allowing more um, uh, some more label propagation, 12.5%, even the accuracy becomes even, even better. And obviously, increasing it, it becomes even better. Obviously, if you have a, a lot of uh, batches and labels coming in, the random sampler will, becomes, will start becoming uh, really good uh, as well, which makes absolute sense. You have more points in the space uh, you, can, you can sample. Now, um, so 
essentially, and I'll, 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 uh, I'll zip my mouth and I'll conclude, uh, and I will not go into uh, the semi-supervised thing, uh, but um, uh, feel free to ask questions if you want later or uh, drop me out or go to GitHub and check everything uh, with your patience and your uh, calmness. But uh, essentially, um, what I wanted to show is that obviously these tools um, are not the holy grail of doing a, a label propagation and message. Engineering and knowledge is always uh, needed. And I think what this shows is that we just can have a more guided uh, learner of uh, having more robust clusters with very limited uh, data. And that is computationally quite efficient. And also it gives some, some information. I think from the moment that these clusters start to form, then, uh, and you have with the queries that you query them a good understanding of where they belong, obviously then you can start putting some uh, physical uh, knowledge behind it. For example, the toolware, what the company did, uh, element six, I forgot to name uh, the company. What they did is they went then and they added their own perspective of what are the different uh, clusters that they're forming. And this way they would know also uh, what is happening uh, across these lines. Um, now all these active learning things, because they query very limited data, uh, they're quite robust and they suffer of uh, bias a lot of times. So you need to bear that in mind uh, because it can sample at spaces that they're not very uh, informative but, and that can become commutationally sometimes very expensive. And this is where uh, a, an extension of that becomes with semi-supervised learning, where in semi-supervised learning, you have some data, you have some engineering knowledge. Someone had told you, look, I have some points that I know exactly what is happening and what is uh, the extension of uh, my engineering data. And you can start again propagating these labels to create a more informative uh, uh, classification procedure and query and query procedure. Now, I will uh, not go through all that stuff, uh, but um, I can give the slides uh, to Eleni and Christian, and they can uh, forward them, uh, obviously. Uh, so, and then you can combine uh, almost everything uh, together uh, with some labels and some uh, query. Uh, query learning. I think with that, um, guys, I'll shut up. I think um, I just want to give you a perspective of um, this this really nice guilty pleasure of um, uh, partially supervised uh, learning. And I think a nice thing we're starting to look in is how you can add gray box models into this this stuff as well. So how you can add some uh, physics. Um, on top of it, so you can do some sort of extrapolation, but also uh, you can have a more robust way of do risk-based and decision-making uh, uh, procedures. Um, thanks so much uh, for uh, for listening, and uh, feel free to ask any questions uh, if you have. Thank you very much, Nico, for this nice overview, which I think was a very nice way to go over the options of uh, learning in different schemes. Uh, maybe again, we open the floor for questions. Maybe Christian has one. Uh, I see he's unmuted. I do. I do have a question. Thank you, Nikos, for this lovely presentation. Very interesting. <clears throat> I have a question regarding uh, some of your uh, early slides where you show the clusters and the division. Um, I, I, I wonder how are you managing dimensions because uh, that uh, th those slides show uh, you know two D two dimensional uh, vector. I assume it's two dimensional vector, but in slide thirty you show like a three dimensional. But what if you have uh, you know vectors with n dimensional? For example, I have a case of uh, yeah. an in study where we use a vector of fourteen, 14 dimensions. So. Christian, lovely question. It just goes bananas, uh, especially with uh, the Gaussian mixture models. I think, I think, but that I think that's a general problem we have um, in machine learning community anyway. Very high dimensional spaces. Um, it can handle a good number of dimensions. I think in engineering, um, we can pin down some of our knowledge of the features uh, we want to use. Um, uh, 
FRFs, for example, or transmissibilities, we know uh, sometimes that we want to look in specific regimes on the frequency peaks in acoustic emissions. We can see the burst. We know what we want to do. In guided waves, we're doing, for example, we know we can use a PA0 uh, uh, mode, uh, the, uh, other dispersion modes. So I think, I think, or S0 modes. So I think we are lucky and unlucky at the sense that we can pin that down. I think dimensionality reduction is not bad if it is done uh, correctly in the normalization and normalization is correct. Uh, sometimes you lose information, obviously, by uh, reducing the dimensions. Um, there are, so in, in, in the GitHub, you can see that uh, Lawrence uh, now uh, as well, where he's in the Alan Turing Institute with uh, Cambridge, we have developed a more high, higher dimensional um, algorithm to take advantage uh, of, uh, of that uh, high dimensional spaces, especially in classification. And you can ride the boat of um, deep learning uh, <laughs> as well. But um, I think, um, although I'm always hesitant with deep learning, unless it's really, really needed. But I think there are options. I, I think it's the, it's the query technology that is the important part here, but obviously the high dimensional space, generally the, this curse we have of dimensionality is an issue here as well. Thank you. So you don't recommend like trying it in a very high dimensional case, your particular uh, algorithm? You, you, ca you can. I mean, the hierarchical, the tree-based one wouldn't have any problem handling higher dimensions. It just, mm -hmm. it will take forever. Mm -hmm. um, GMMs uh, can work a little bit, uh, can work better in lower dimensional spaces because of the hyperparameters in uh, mm -hmm. and the inversions. But I think, I yeah, I wouldn't recommend a lot of dimensions, um, but th there are tools that you can use if, if you want to use higher dimensions. Unfortunately, we don't have Lawrence here, and Lawrence could give you a better answer of the updated thing he's doing in Dell and Turing, but you can handle some of the higher dimensional spaces. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any further questions for Nikos? Hey, Nikos, I had a question, if it's okay. Yes, um, hi. Hey, how are you doing? Um, I was wondering, for example, in the case of Chandy's uh, toolware clustering, mm. I don't know, I guess uh, when I did something like that, I think it's most common that they measure toolware in millimeters of wear, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I guess you just had 12 different categories of millimeter bands. Oh, Tom, are you going to ask me very deep engineering <laughs> things about machining? No, it, it, I can keep it theoretical because it's fine. I was just going to say, I was wondering at this point, you kind of would are getting close to almost doing regression style things by predicting the millimeters of wear. And I was wondering if such an active learning thing and like a regression thing, you could do it as well. Tom, lovely point. Um, you're right. So we have done that with uh, guided waves with the Los Alamos guys, where, where you're right. You're, if you have so many uh, continuous clusters, you come to a regression point. And yes, Tom, uh, you can use active learning in regression. Uh, there's okay a very active field in machine learning. Uh, there is a lovely, lovely stuff happening now with active uh, learning on Gaussian processes, uh, which uh, they take advantage of the kernels and the sparsity of the kernels. It's a really lovely thing that comes forward. So you're right, you can use a regression there as well. Yeah, I guess with something like a Gaussian process, you have the obvious thing of the predicted variance on the output, right? Which can give you a tint, hint of where to look. Yes. Yes. Oh, cool. Thanks, Nikos. Yes. So maybe with this, and uh, just to maybe close on uh, the note that you want to leave us with, I wanted to ask Yang first, and then Nikos, what would be your closing message, let's say, for our seminar, for those interested in uh, methods, you know, largely in the domain of SHM, probably coming from different backgrounds, as we have figured out for our audience. <laughs> so first with Yang, maybe what would be your message um well yeah thank you uh ilani for giving me another opportunity to speak um i think echoing echoing what we uh, had earlier the discussions we had earlier uh, there are indeed uh, many many problems that are unsolved uh, in this domain if you are a young researcher or graduate student uh, there's a plenty of opportunities uh, for you to 
uh, make uh, uh, excellent achievements uh, in in this field. So um, we, I think, I, one thing that uh, I wish is that uh, uh, we could have more collaboration, more sharing in our community. So that's I'm putting my hat for the ASEMI. Uh, uh, structure health monitoring control chair on uh, the community chair is uh, one most of our initiatives in uh, recent uh, uh, years are, are sharing our data experimental data and sharing our code just like uh, Nicole uh, just mentioned as well putting algorithms your, your code on github to let more uh, people uh, to make them more available to, to other people uh, and together we can move the entire field forward more efficiently rather than having everyone uh, reinventing the wheel. Uh, uh, reading a paper, having a student spending uh, one year to, uh, implementing the algorithm in the paper, et cetera. Uh, you know, I, I think there's more sharing uh, within the community can probably help us to move forward more efficiently. That's one thing I want to mention. Thank you. Thank you, Yang. And maybe for Nikos, uh, what you would like to leave us with? Given well, the overview you gave us. Well, first of all, thanks all of you uh, for being around. I and thanks for the invitation again. And I echo um, what uh, Yang uh, said. I would say, Eleni, I think uh, because we're um, engineers um, or physicists like <laughs> myself, I think, and I know both myself and Eleni, we had a lot of machine learning papers in various journals from MSSP to I think looking back into physics, and um, I think it's really important. I love machine learning. I spent all my life with this group doing a lot of machine learning stuff, but I think um, we should not forget the physics. It's the only way we can understand what is happening, and I think we can do extrapolation. And I think integrated that from now on into our any data analysis or machine learning or what or AI or whatever, uh, or Digimons, as I call digital twins. Mm. Um, I, I think merging the two is really, really uh, important. I think for all of us uh, to move forward uh, from bland instrumentation of- Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, yeah. And Eleni, I really want to ask you all this time, is that white box a camera? Wait, which one? The one next at the left side of your- <laughs> No, no, it's a fiber optic uh, sensor box. <laughs> so I said I'm in the office for sure. Uh, okay, so from my side, I really want to thank everyone who participated, especially our two speakers from today, and then Vasilis, Napi, and uh, Christian for organizing, participating in this series. So Christian, I leave the closing statement to you. Thank you, Eleni. Uh, I would like to thank uh, our presenters today. It's been a great couple of uh, presentations, just like, you know, the other, I don't know, 10 or 12 that we have held uh, during the past, over the past uh, year or so. Thank you all for the, you know, willingness to participate for, for the openness. And uh, I take your willingness to collaborate and to be open with, uh, you know, with your research. That's really useful in the community. I would also like to thank Eleni and uh, ETH team for for you know this you know being open to this collaboration and look forward to uh, doing more stuff together. Uh, also, Nati, my colleague from Spol, who has been you know very helpful, uh, is here, and we would like to invite you to you know to keep engaged, to keep curious, and to keep you know looking for opportunities to collaborate. Uh, thank you all, and have a great rest of uh, the year. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.